Chapter 19 of Jerry McCauley, His Life and Work by Jerry McCauley and edited by Robert M. Offord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kristen Hand. Chapter 19, Jerry McCauley's Cremorne Mission. We sing the love that sought us. We praise the blood that bought us. We bless the grace that brought us back to the fold of God. In preceding pages, some account has been given of the change made by Jerry in his field of operations. Succeeding events have justified the step he took, although some of his best friends and most active co-workers did not advise it at the time, and indeed expressed themselves as to doubting the wisdom of the change. They feared, no doubt, that the Water Street mission would suffer, and possibly become extinct. But it was God's work, and God has taken care of it. Jerry was undoubtedly led of God to commence operations at number 104 West 32nd Street, the location of the Cremorne Mission. Close to a crowded thoroughfare and in a locality where sin openly abounds, such a beacon of warning is eminently in its place. From its first opening until the present time, there has been an uninterrupted display of God's grace in saving power. Souls were saved at the very outset, and souls are being saved there now. Of course, its earthly founder is missed. His presence, his testimony, his personal intercourse with men and women, his happy way of conducting the services are no more. And in being deprived of these, the mission has sustained a great loss. But the work had a heavenly founder as well as an earthly one, and he remains. His presence is still vouchsafed. The voice of the Son of God is still heard, bringing the dead to life, speaking liberty to the bound, rest to the weary, hope and cheer to the hopeless, pardon to the penitent. God uses means. He is pleased to save souls through human instrumentalities, and when Jerry died, the trustees in charge of the mission realized that a superintendent must be appointed in his stead. Many friends of the cause asked, who can take his place? To say that none could do so would be to limit the power of God to anoint souls for his work. The trustees felt that God had the agent ready, and so sought wisdom and direction from above. The result of their prayers and thought is well known. From the very beginning of his mission work, Jerry had found a consecrated, cheerful, and able helper in the person of his wife. To her sacred trust, the conduct of the mission was committed, and God is blessing her labors and those of the many faithful and devoted helpers who seek to uphold her hands. With the same deep love and hunger for souls that characterized her husband, with never-failing tact, with much of Jerry's gift of keen penetration into human nature, Mrs. McCauley labors to the utmost of her strength in her unremitting efforts to win the lost. She gives her testimony in the meetings as she has always done, often with tears in her own eyes and often bringing tears to the eyes of her listeners. She speaks frankly of her lost condition before Jesus saved her. It is a sad story. She does not glory in it. Far from that, it is with a pang of grief and with a sense of humiliation that she tells it. But she feels, as Jerry ever felt, that poor souls, hearing how she was lifted from the depths and so royally redeemed, will take heart and be led to seek the same saving grace that she found. And it is just in this way that her testimony and the testimonies of others given in the mission meetings are blessed. What more effective servant could he whose eyes Christ opened have preached than this? One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see." And the testimony uttered by so many and so constantly owned of God to the salvation of souls in the Cremorne mission is just this. I was lost, but now I am saved. Jesus has saved me. In this connection, as showing that God's favor is still vouchsafed to the work, it will be in order to introduce the following sketch of the services at the Cremorne mission. It was prepared by the writer at the time for Jerry McCauley's newspaper, and is in its various features characteristic of the meetings in general. The sketch reports the service held on Sunday evening, November 9, 1884. It is copied in full. A Cremorn Sunday Evening We have never attended a service in which the various parts blended more harmoniously or linked more completely than that of Sunday night, November 9, at the Cremorn Mission. The Holy Spirit was present in great power. There was no mere excitement, no froth, but a tidal wave of blessing that carried us before it. Tears fell, for they could not be restrained. Strong men wept, and men and women smiled through their tears. So far as interest was concerned, there was not a dull minute. 
In view of the packed hall, we were led to wonder why ministers should complain of the difficulty of getting a Sabbath evening audience, as many ministers do complain. People come here, people of all classes and from various quarters of the city. As usual on Sunday evenings, many friends were compelled to stand, yet one seat was vacant. The chair of the departed missionary, Jerry McCauley, has never been occupied since his death. It stands upon the platform in the old place. We have no veneration for wood, but that empty chair, with its drapery of black, speaks volumes sometimes. Yes, the vacant chair has a voice. Hark to its words of warning. Be ye also ready. Hark to its words of encouragement. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. After the service of song, a prayer was offered, and the 55th chapter of Isaiah was read by the leader, Mr. Corning. This is the chapter that opens with the call to the thirsty to buy and eat without money and without price. With exemplary brevity, the leader spoke of the rich blessings enjoyed here on past occasions, and called for testimonies from those who accepted Christ as their Savior. I am glad that I am able and willing and anxious to speak for Jesus, said the first. Seven or eight years ago, he was precious to my soul, and I enjoyed his love. Then an evil spirit seemed to take possession of me. I fell away and became addicted to the use of strong drink. Through this, I was separated from my wife and children. I came to New York, and when the past rose up before me, as it often would, I would drink to drown the memories. I met a brother, Brother M, over there, and he brought me to his house. Then he brought me to this mission. Each testimony I heard here struck me hard. I went forward to those chairs, but I did not get satisfied that night, and I fell back again. A few days ago, I met Brother M again, and he induced me to come here, and I went again as a seeker to those chairs. There was a great void in me until then, but I rejoice to be able to tell you that the void is filled. The love of Christ has filled it. I rejoice in him tonight. One of the hymns we had sung, Walk in the Light, etc., brought another to his feet. Last night, on his way home from the Florence mission, he met with drunken men lying in dark corners of the streets, their only sleeping place. This brought to mind his former condition. Before the light of which we had just been singing dawned on him, he had often slept in just such corners. He had long been a slave of strong drink. Now, he added, I look up and thank God that I am walking in the light, the beautiful light of God. The light had been growing brighter all along. God had taught him how to sing and to speak, to watch and pray. Pray, God, he said, to show me other poor drunkards that I may go to and speak about Jesus. Brother M, referred to by the first friend who testified, twice essayed to speak, but was prevented first by another testimony, then by the call for the singing of a hymn. The devil, he said, tempted me to keep quiet when I was twice prevented from speaking, but I would not let him beat me that way. I did everything I could when that brother who spoke first was serving God years ago to lead him to ruin. We were old friends. We were in the fire department together and in the army together, and I may say we went through the mill together. So it was not to be wondered at that I should seek to have him saved. I am so happy. God has saved my soul from hell, and I want him saved too. After we left the mission last night, he did not feel as though God had forgiven him his sin. Tonight, four of us went up into the gallery before the time for this service had come, and there we prayed that he might confess Christ tonight, and he has done it. There was something very touching about this incident. The joy of the one friend at having the deep void in his heart filled was so evident that it was contagious. But when we heard of Brother M's deep anxiety for his old associate's conversion, and then of this little gallery prayer meeting, and saw the prompt response vouchsafed of God, our hearts were deeply affected. We recalled the four men who brought their palsied friend to Jesus and whose faith was so honored of the master. A sense of holy awe fell upon the meeting. We felt that the gracious Savior was most assuredly present through his Holy Spirit. No man can truly say that Jesus is the Lord unless thou take the veil away and breathe the living word. The veil had been removed, and so we knew that the Holy Spirit was at work among us. We realized the words. Heaven comes down our souls to greet, and glory crowns the mercy seat. The next speaker had known the Lord for several years. He meets with adversaries at his daily toil. They ask him why he believes in God when he cannot see any God. He tells them that when at sea he steered by the compass, though he could not see the land to which it pointed, and thus steering he reached the port in safety. 
So since he had steered by God's word, he had known peace and joy, although he had not seen God face to face. I know whom I have put my trust in, said another. It is Jesus Christ. Many a time I have said to Jerry Macaulay, Mr. Macaulay, I mean, by the grace of God to keep in this way. He would say, my boy, hold on to Christ. Now he has fought and won, but he is not out of sight altogether. I shall meet him again. I could praise God tonight. How do I praise him for answering my prayer for mercy ten months ago? Another said. We sang from the hymn, let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave, etc. When a convert said, that illustrates my case. There had not been a light in 32nd Street, I should probably have been in perdition now. Until I came here 18 months ago, my wife and family were heartbroken. I was a drunkard, and when I came home, my wife did not know whether to expect a kind word or a blow. This went on for 18 years. It seemed as if there was something down in perdition drawing me there. Rum had so much the best of me that I had lost my will. How many fights with the devil I had. 18 months ago, I came here and was saved, and now I am able to say no when tempted to do wrong. I thought I was as good as anybody until, as I came to this meeting, I discovered I was as bad as anybody, was the testimony of one who added, I want to keep my light low, that others may see it. My prayer is that God may keep me humble and honest. The next speaker came to pay a farewell visit to the mission. About two years and a half ago, as he and an associate walked along 6th Avenue, he said to his friend, John, come along and let us see what kind of place they have got here meaning the mission. He came, and to tell the story in his own words, I came five times, and I was convicted of sin. I saw I was in the wrong way, yet I was not willing to surrender to Jesus. Two years and seven months ago, I knelt down at those chairs and sought and found mercy. Further on, the Lord called me out to work for him, and now I am bound for the Congo. I leave next Saturday with a band of missionaries. Pray God to use us for salvation of precious souls. It was on an Easter Sunday that the speaker first found peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. At this point, a verse of hymn number 72 in Gospel Praise Book was called for and sung with much fervor. Behold the changing autumn leaves, behold the fields of ripening grain. Go gather in the golden sheaves from valley hill and distant plain. Then reapers haste, the skies are clear, the fields resound the glad refrain. The harvesters from far and near are gathering in the golden grain. I wish that brother God speed, said Mrs. Macaulay, but he won't find a blacker heart in all Africa than mine was in this city of New York before Jesus saved me over fifteen years ago, and he has kept me ever since. Pray God to bless this brother in Africa, and to bless me here. A brother said he had been impressed with a hymn song at the church service which he had attended in the morning, If I've Jesus, only Jesus. It was such a comfort to him to know that he could take Jesus to his work with him in the morning. For nearly 14 years, he had found a friend in Jesus. The speaker commended the decision of the young brother who was going to Africa. Missionaries did good. He remembered a missionary in Hong Kong whose words had produced a deep impression on him. The brother had a very happy experience when he was saved. Previous to his finding peace, it seemed as though hell were just ready to swallow him up. It was 8 o'clock one morning when he realized he was saved. For twelve days after that, he hardly knew whether he was in the body or out because of Christ's wonderful peace and joy in his soul. That same peace and joy has been experienced by another who told something of what grace had done for him. There are no limits to the power of Christ to save, he said. A little over thirty years ago, I was with a bad crowd in California. I learned the tricks that are vain. I knew I was doing wrong, and I was on the wrong path until nearly five years ago. Then I resolved to change my course of life, and I did it with an earnestness that God honored. Jerry gave me the text, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I had schemed and planned and troubled a good deal to get these very things which God promised to give if I would obey him. I resolved from that moment out to test God's promise. I took a good letter to Mr. H., then the head of a large dry goods establishment, but he dismissed me rudely, and when I left him, the old nature began boiling up. Then I said to myself, this is not what I promised God. Presently, as I was going down the Bowery, I met an old associate who unfolded a little scheme. He wanted me to take part in it, and my share in the transaction would have yielded me $40 in 20 minutes, 
but I told him I had made a promise to God, and I would stick to it if I starved, so I could not have anything more to do with such schemes. Then I met a broker who had given me many points, and he never gave me any information that I failed on when I used it. But I told him that I did not want to hear any of his points. I went on to the Water Street Mission, and Sister Macaulay gave me a day's work. I scrubbed the floor and cleaned the windows of the mission. When I had got through, she said they were done better than ever she had got them done. Well, I had prayed God to instruct me as I did the work. Now I am doing well. God sent me a friend who put me into business, lending me money. I am prospering and hope to be out of debt by next spring. From my experience, I can say, put your trust in God, he'll honor it. One Sunday evening, a woman called for a dress my wife was making for her. The dress was not quite finished, for the buttons had to be sewn on. The customer wanted my wife to complete the work there and then, but she would not do it because it was Sunday. Then the woman was angry and called my wife a thief, saying she believed the dress had been pawned. She then left, but next morning she came in again. She lived in Brooklyn, but had stayed in New York at a friend's house all night. She expressed her sorrow for her conduct on the previous day, got her dress, and paid six dollars for it. We found then, as we have ever since, that God's providences will come in when they are needed. I have grown in faith since I first started in this way. Until 22 years old, a gentleman said he had been without God, being utterly ignorant of the Bible, never having read it an hour in his life. Then he was persuaded to seek the Lord. God opened his eyes, and while he saw he was a sinner, he saw also that he was the very sinner Christ came into the world to save. For three score years and three, he had been a Christian, and Jesus had proved more and more precious to him. It was grand to hear this veteran talk of the peace with God, the peace of soul, the absence of anxiety and forgiveness, and the blessed consciousness of sins forgiven, and of a title to life eternal which he enjoyed. He commanded this religion of Christ and concluded with the statement that there had been too much testimony given that night to be neglected. A solemn thought was presented by another. It was the close proximity of the living and the dead. In these seats sat the saved and the unsaved. This mission place was God's house. The place next door below might well be characterized as hell. So there was many a one here tonight in whose heart there was heaven, while there was a very hell in the heart that beat next to him. But God's word was, He that hath the Son hath life. And those now lost had but a step to take to make Christ theirs, and so take heaven for hell. Some might fear to accept Christ and start in the Christian way because they wondered how they could be Christians amid the temptations of life. But to those who believe in Christ, God gives the power to become sons. I cannot tell you how he does it, says the speaker. He takes away the stony heart and gives us a new heart. He has given me 15 years of this life in which I have had more peace and joy than I can ever tell. A sister said it was two years and over since she realized that God had forgiven her sins. She had had much forgiven. Addicted to the use of a strong and poisonous drug, she had gone far towards destroying herself. Indeed, physicians told her that she had but six months to live. It was when in this sad state that she was laid under conviction of sin and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved her and destroyed the power of her awful appetite. He forgave her sins and healed her body. She then resolved to consecrate herself to the Lord, and she thought he would surely lead her into some missionary service. But no, the way opened into a kitchen, with cooking and washing and ironing to be done. This was a strange, mysterious providence. Friends told her she was wasting her time, but she said she believed the Lord had put her there. At this work, she proposed to stay till the Lord opened a way out. This the Lord had now done. She, too, was about to start for Africa, and she had reason to know that domestic acts which she had been learning would make her useful in her new field of labor. A young man told us that two years ago he came here to transact some business with Jerry McCauley. As he sat here and heard what was said, he became convicted of sin and then sought forgiveness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. All along, the Christian's religion had been presented in glowing colors. The friends who spoke bore abundant evidence that to have the grace of Christ Jesus in the heart was to have a treasure indeed. In view of this, there was great force in the words of a young brother, who, after telling us that God had saved him too, added, All this we got without money and without price. Great indeed is the wealth of the Christian inheritance, priceless in value, yet offered without price. After the testimonies, an earnest appeal was made to the unsaved to make this the night of their surrender to Christ. Do not wait for feeling. It is the devil's trick to destroy souls, to make you wait for feeling, the speaker said. 
He then recited some thrilling incidents that were told in a way not to be forgotten. By each incident, some point was emphasized, and the address was most solemn, tender, and earnest. When the opportunity was afforded, a number of persons raised the hand to signify that they wished to start on the Christian life and that they desired prayer. Thus, the first service was brought to a close. We rejoice to know that some left the place rejoicing in the knowledge of their newly found Lord and Savior. The angels had work to do in bearing the tidings home, and there was joy in heaven as well as on earth, for heaven makes merry over the salvation of the lost. Some years have passed since this record was made, but the meetings continue with unabated interest. The prayer of the penitent is still heard, wanderers are reclaimed, backsliders are restored, and God's free grace revealed in Christ is glorified. Here, too, those who are moralists and know not Christ's presence in the heart are convicted of their need for his salvation. The respectable and the ragged, the self-righteous and the sinner bow side by side at the throne of grace and are brought to know the Lord Jesus as a personal Savior. End of chapter 19